This lecture is going to go through movement of solutes throughout the renal tubule. This is a great picture to start with. We have a labeled tubule and we have different processes color coded as well. We're going to begin, um, the movement begins in Bowman's capsule, BC, part of the renal corpuscle. Everything in red is moving to the bloodstream. So that's our reabsorption. It's been filtered by the glomerulus. Now it's moving through these different mechanisms back into the bloodstream. So I want you to notice the proximal convoluted tubule. There's a huge amount of reabsorption here. And that makes sense when we think about just things moving high to low concentration. Then we get to the loop of Henle, and we have all the different products leaving the descending limb. Um, so there's a high amount of things still being trafficked out at the descending loop of Henle. And at the ascending loop of Henle, I want you to notice that you don't see water moving anywhere. So the descending limb, we will have movement of water back into the blood, but once it moves up to the ascending limb, there's only movement of sodium chloride, magnesium, calcium, reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule. Convoluted means complicated, it's all twisty. The distal convoluted tubule is broken up into the proximal or first portion and then the distal portion, the distal, distal convoluted tubule. So in the proximal DCT, we have reabsorption of sodium chloride, calcium. The distal portion, there's reabsorption of sodium chloride and water. And the distal portion is also going to be the place where we see secretion. So if you want to remember the part for secretion, it's the distal. DCT. That means when there's high levels of potassium, hydrogen, urea that are out in the bloodstream, an active transport system can physically bring them in and add them to this ultrafiltrate. Then once we get to the collecting duct, which is essentially what moves um, everything that's now been ultrafiltered by the renal tubule down to the renal pelvis to become urine, there is only going to be water movement, but that is going to be contingent upon the presence of antidiuretic hormone. If there is no ADH release, we're not going to see a lot of water movement here, and we'll see why that is. So this is showing you physically what's moving in each area, either reabsorption or secretion. So ADH is going to be important here, and also up in this uh, distal portion, we're going to see hormone activity also with aldosterone, so secretion and aldosterone action. When you are thinking about the basics for each of these places, um, here is what you should know for proximal convoluted tubule. At the very basic, it is the place where there's the highest amount of reabsorption. Again, that makes sense because all the filtrates are in really high concentration when they first get here. And that's going to be a higher concentration than what's in the associated bloodstream. So a lot of this is just going to be simple act or passive transport down concentration gradients. So it's the largest amount of reabsorption. Um, all of these processes can move a large amount of substances back into the bloodstream. So reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule is very high. There's also a high amount of permeability to water. So a lot of water is reabsorbed here. In the same way that we have small intestines being the place where most um, absorption happens because it's the first place, like the duodenum has the highest amount of absorption. Um, same thing with proximal convoluted tubule. It's simply because of the concentration gradient. Everything is really high there, which means it's more likely to leave if there's a way for it to leave. This is the simple, <laughs> try to make it as simple as possible, the proximal convoluted tubule, this is what it looks like, really highly metabolic cells, lots of mitochondria, because it's really active. We need to generate ATP to move 
different substances. It's got an extensive brush border, again, in the same way that the small intestines have a brush border to aid in absorption. These cells look really similar in the proximal convoluted tubule. They're thick, they're active, and they have this brush border, finger-like extensions which add um, surface area for reabsorption. There's a lot of transporters in the proximal convoluted tubule, which you would expect because this is the area of high reabsorption. There are sodium glucose co-transporters here. Glucose has to move in co-transport unless it's the beta cells of the pancreas or brain cells. All other places, it's co-transported. In the kidneys, it's co-transported with glucose. So co-transporters are symporters. They move two substances in the same direction. There's also antiporters in this sec session section. We know all cells are going to have the sodium potassium pump, which is an antiporter. There's also sodium hydrogen antiporters in this area. The first half of the tubule, uh, sodium will be reabsorbed with glucose in that co-transport, and it's also reabsorbed with amino acids. The second half of the tubule, sodium is reabsorbed pretty passively with chloride. So you do have to know these for those of you in chiropractic for your boards. They will ask the location of various co-transporters and antiporters. We know all cells have the antiporter sodium potassium ATPase. Um, so this is a location of sodium glucose co-transporters and sodium hydrogen antiporters, which means two things in opposite directions. Okay, so as we look along the proximal convoluted tubule, so down here you're just looking at length, so as you traverse the proximal convoluted tubule, that is correlated in this graph with the plasma concentrations um, and the tubular fluid concentrations of different substances. Remember I said things move just by their concentration gradient, so they will move from high to low concentration. So you're going to see levels of glucose go down once you get to the end of the proximal convoluted tubule because we want it. We want to keep that. Same thing with amino acids. We want to keep it. Bicarbonate, we're going to keep more of that. Um, where you do see levels of sodium, chloride, urea pretty stable, um, we will see creatinine levels go up because we're not reabsorbing any of that, right? These products right here are dependent upon osmolarity of the fluid and of the plasma, so we're going to be making the fine-tuning adjustments with those, um, trading them for one another, where creatinine we're just going to incorporate into the urine. So the things we really want to keep, by the time they're uh, through the proximal convoluted tubule, we've sucked most of them up. So this is the largest site for reabsorption. Then we get to the loop of Henle. It's this long loop that has a descending portion and then an ascending portion. And because one side, this descending limb, is permeable to water, and then the ascending <laughs> limb is shut. Sorry, I didn't mean to yell at my dog. Stop. <laughs> People are allowed to exist outside. She is fine. Everything's fine. That is impermeable to water up here. So that creates a physiologic process called the countercurrent exchange, which drives the reabsorption of water. Um, so that we contain sodium in our blood, and that helps with water to follow it. So here are the parts. There's the descending limb, which is very thin and small, so it's called that. So the mailman is here, the thin descending limb. Then we start to go up. There's a thin ascending limb, and then a thicker portion called the thick ascending limb. So again, the descending is permeable to water. The ascending is not, and that's something really special about it. Okay, so first we're looking at the cells of the thin descending, and mainly what you see are cells that don't really have um, a brush border. There's not a ton of mitochondria. That tells you that there's not a lot of active transport going on here. A lot of it is just going to be passive, like water will passively move out of this descending limb. Very thin, not a ton of activity. 
where the ascending limb, those cells are more similar to what the proximal convoluted cells look like. They have a brush border. Um, we now have a hypoosmotic fluid, which is going to be driven by the fact that most of the water has left, and now we have impermeability to water, and that's going to drive this countercurrent attraction of things into that area. So nice thick cells, high metabolic activity, and water can't get in. So that means solutes are going to uh, be traded in this area mainly actively. The pumps, this is important. There are definitely special pumps in the, uh, in the limb, in the loop of Henle. In the thick ascending limb, we have our typical sodium potassium pumps to help maintain sodium low outside of, or, or sorry, inside of cells, potassium high inside. So sodium's high out, potassium's high in, that's normal. It has a resting potential, cool. All right, so other different things that are special about the loop of Henle. We have an antiporter here. We had that before in the proximal convoluted tubule so that's trading sodium in for hydrogen out. And then that same sodium will be trafficked out over here in exchange for potassium. All right, here's the fun one. They love to ask questions about this because there's three things. This is a crazy big co-transporter. It is the one sodium, two chloride, one potassium co-transporter. And it brings all of those things in. Sodium, two chlorides, and then the potassium. And we know potassium should be really high inside of cells. The sodium, we know we're going to trade for the potassium. And then the chloride will be moved out through these different channels. Potassium can move in either direction. There's always leak potassium channels to control the level of the potassium inside of the cells. In the same way you have an overflow pipe in a body of water or in the sewer so they don't overflow, there's always a leak channel. There are drugs called loop diuretics, and you might know diuretics. People call them their water pills because it drives water loss, and people take them to lower the blood pressure. The most strong diuretics are loop diuretics. The most common is furosemide, which in hospitals uh, is sold as Lasix. So that's a common drug and it's given to people quite often to drive water loss and then lower the blood pressure. And the way that loop diuretics work is to physically turn off this three ion co-transporter. And they're really strong and that makes sense. It lowers blood pressure because you're not having the movement of sodium in and then out to the blood. So if you don't have sodium moving to the blood, you won't have water moving to the blood. So there'll be less in the blood and then there won't be as much pressure in vessels. So it's a really great way to lower blood pressure by lowering the amount of plasma volume. So the location of this very specialized transporter, you just have to memorize it. And that's where it is. It's in the loop of Henley, the thick ascending limb, special magical co-transporter. Other items that are reabsorbed in this area, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, they just take the paracellular route and go high to low concentration. So they just go by diffusion. All right, so that was the loop of Henle. Fun things, right? Definitely know that that's where loop diuretics work. One side is permeable to water, the other side is not. So that drives this ultrafiltration process, which helps everything to keep humming along. And that's where loop diuretics work by turning off that three item co-transporter. Now we're at the distal convoluted tubule, the DCT. So this is a duct and it does fun things of physiologic action because that's where secretion happens. Secretion, that's important. You don't see that any other places. All right, so in the distal convoluted tubule, we have typical sodium potassium pumps, ATP aces. We've got chloride leaving through a channel because it's charged, so we don't want free movement of it. So this is the specialized pump in this area. Um, first we have, well, the DCT is like, is the macula densa. 
and this butts right up to the thick ascending loop. It reabsorbs ions, but this is impermeable to water and urea. So 5% of the filtered sodium chloride is going to be reabsorbed at the level of the distal convoluted tubule. So the specialized transporters here, again, we've got our typical sodium potassium pump. That's nothing special. It's moving potassium in, sodium out to maintain the cell's resting potential. Our specialized transporter uh, is a symporter, two things in one direction, a symporter. It is a symporter that moves sodium and chloride actively, this active transport, into the cell which is okay because it would normally move together. The other type of diuretics are, there's a bunch, um, thiazide diuretics, they work here. And the way that they work is turning off this co-transporter, this symporter. Because if you don't have sodium moving into these cells to move into the bloodstream, you won't have water going in. Again, you'll have low plasma volume low blood pressure. So they work really nicely to lower blood pressure and they work to turn this off. So the DCT, this is the specialized site where thiazide diuretics work and they turn off this naturally occurring sodium chloride co-transporter symporter. Okay, yeah, we're just going right through here. And then next to the distal convoluted tubule, which we'll talk about again really quickly, is the collecting duct. The renal tubule describes all of these pieces from Bowman's capsule to the distal convoluted tubule. The collecting duct's not technically a part of the renal tubule. It is part of the nephron, but not the renal tubule. It's just a collecting duct that collects urine. So now we're up here. So we talked about the loops, okay? So we talked about those loops, we talked about these thiazide diuretic areas and specialized pumps. So we've got our co-transporters here and here. These are all impermeable to water. Now at the early distal convoluted tubule, highly metabolic cells, large mitochondria. So we're going to see a large amount of reabsorption because now this we had a low amount of water because we were impermeable to it. So we're gonna have a pretty hypertonic um, fluid at this point. By the time we get to the late distal tubule and the collecting tubule, we are going to see that these cells are highly active. There's not much of a brush border at the late distal tubule where there is at the early. And these are areas that are going to be influenced by not only pumps and osmolality of the system, but also by hormones. All right, so the late distal tubule cortical collecting duct. So here it's labeled ADH and HTO or H2O, getting tired, man. So that's going to be affected by antidiuretic hormone. Um, intercalated discs are a term that you'll hear in cardiac cells as well. They are cells that are connected via gap junction. So they work as a sheet and that can share things between them. They help reabsorb potassium from the lumen and secrete it in response or in exchange for hydrogen. Um, these principal cells in the late distal tubule collecting duct area, they reabsorb sodium and water from the lumen and then secrete in response to that potassium. You'll find just typical sodium potassium pumps here, but you'll also see these specialized pumps that aldosterone is going to influence. Again, the most important thing about um, these areas is going to be their influence by hormones. So the first thing that we have is antidiuretic hormone, and this is actually a live video, I love it. Let's make sure it's working right here. So we've got antidiuretic hormone, old school name vasopressin, and when antidiuretic hormone is released, so here's antidiuretic hormone binding to its receptors. It's in the bloodstream, and then it'll come here and bind to its receptors. What it does, see what ADH binds, we get activation of this intracellular signaling cascade. And inside of vesicles, just waiting to be useful, are these little channels. They look like Mickey Mouse, right? Those are called aquaporin channels. And when ADH binds to its receptor, these aquaporin channels are moved from their vesicles and then inserted into the membrane. 
What that means is that in the collecting duct, instead of having um, water just go into the urine so that there's a clear watery urine, which usually lets you know that you're well hydrated, when you are in states of dehydration, ADH activates aquaporin channel insertion so that water can move through them and then the water can be reabsorbed. When there is no ADH around, then the aquaporin channels just remain in their vesicles, they're not inserted into the membrane, and the water will go into the urine. So ADH drives the movement of fluid, movement of water specifically, by causing the insertion of aquaporin channels into this area so that the fluid can be reabsorbed. So check that out if you want to click on that yourself. That's the way that it works. So again, aquaporin channel here gets inserted into this membrane. Here's one. So it comes out of its vesicle. It gets inserted. So then water can move out and be reabsorbed. That only happens when ADH is released. And this happens in the collecting duct. Collecting duct is the area where antidiuretic hormone has activity. The other thing that's important about um, these like DCT, late DCT collecting duct cells is that there are normal, again, sodium potassium pumps here, but there is a specialized process right here um, that is going to trade potassium and sodium for one another. So these drugs are called potassium sparing diuretics. So I'm just gonna back up for a second. When people are taking like the most common diuretic, Lasix. So look at what it's turning off. It's turning off this big pump. And it's, we're trying to target the sodium to lower water, but we're also going to limit things like potassium. So if you're blocking sodium, you're also blocking chloride and then potassium, and then potassium can't go into the bloodstream. And then you have low potassium. And that sucks, and you've got to eat some bananas, but you get muscle cramps and discomfort. And that's the main side effect from taking a low diuretic, is low levels of potassium. When people have low levels of potassium, it's called hypokalemia, with a K, um, that leads to the decision to put them on a different type of diuretic. Maybe it's a thiazide diuretic because here it's just trading sodium and chloride and turning that off to lower the blood pressure. But really commonly, you'll see the use of these um, potassium sparing diuretics. And the way that potassium sparing diuretics is, work is they turn off the pump that normally is activated when aldosterone is released. So aldosterone is our sodium sparing hormone. When we're dehydrated, aldosterone drives sodium to be moved into the bloodstream. So it causes activation of this pump. So potassium comes in, sodium goes out, and it enhances that action because we want sodium in the bloodstream to raise the blood pressure. When somebody is on a potassium sparing diuretic, the most common is spironolactone. Um, it turns off this ATPase so that there's no sodium going out into the bloodstream, but that also means that there's not going to be inward movement of potassium into the cell. If the sodium's not moving into the cell, where is it? Well, it's in the bloodstream, right? So here, so that's why things are in red. There you go, it's blocking movement into the blood. We're blocking the movement of sodium into the blood, which means we're gonna keep potassium into the blood, in the blood. That means the main side effect of aldosterone antagonists, drugs that block this pump, is going to be hyperkalemia, too much potassium. Those people can't have any bananas. Isn't that sad? probably. So this is going to be the site of action for potassium sparing diuretics. And this is normally what aldosterone does. It's our sodium sparing hormone. It helps us retain sodium instead of peeing it out. And it enhances this activity um, by targeting these cells in the late DCT to early collecting duct area. So these areas are really important for um, the physiologic function of the body and they can be targeted by drugs. All right, final place, medullary collecting duct, final site for urine processing. We already talked about ADH, the permeability to water. If 
there's no antidiuretic hormone in the body, if there's none released, then there's no aquaporin channels. That means the water is going to come out and go into the urine. If ADH is released, we are going to see the insertion of aquaporin channels. And then instead of the water moving out here to the toilet or the tree, it's going to move out of the aquaporin channels and into the bloodstream. So the medullary collecting duct, its permeability is going to be controlled almost exclusively by antidiuretic hormone. It is permeable to urea in this area, and you can also see secretion, see this inward movement of hydrogen ions, which means if somebody is in an acidotic state and there's a low pH because there's a too much hydrogen out here, we can add that here. Typically, though, when we think of sites of secretion, it's up here in the late distal convoluted tubule. So we're going to see aldosterone action up here and down in this area. We're going to see antidiuretic hormone action. Beautiful. So we see secretion here, a little bit of secretion down in the collecting duct. Okay, so here everything is written out for you. And as fluid or filtrate traverses the length of this tubule, the concentration gradients are going to drive movement of different things that will be influenced by whether or not those areas are permeable to fluid or not. Um, so we know proximal convoluted, primary site of reabsorption, descending, passive reabsorption of water, Ascending, we're going to passively reabsorb mainly sodium chloride. So now we have, we had a hypertonic fluid. Now we have a hypotonic or even hypertonic fluid because there's, it's hyperosmotic. The distal convoluted tubule, we're going to see secretion of things. Um, we're going to see aldosterone action. And then the collecting duct, we have mainly movement of water in the case of ADH release. Ooh, beautiful. Here is a picture of all of the specialized pumps that you should know. Uh, in green are the different drugs we mentioned, so potassium sparing, aldosterone action, thiazides blocking the sodium chloride pump, loop diuretics, they're blocking that specialized co-transporter, and then we have also things like where most activity is. So we have the largest amount of reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule, and then absorption or permeability to water in descending, impermeability in ascending. These letters are thick ascending loop, proximal convoluted tubule. So everything you need to know is here, aldosterone, ADH, all the drugs. This is a beautiful slide. You should definitely look at it and study it and know what it means. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Shoot me a comment. Okay, here are some of the hormones that we've mentioned throughout the lectures, you can read those over so that you can remember the activity of them. Remember mainly the two that I am most interested in you knowing are aldosterone, which are, is our sodium sparing hormone. And then we have antidiuretic hormone, which is our water sparing hormone. And then we have angiotensin II, ANP, and PTH, which are going to affect Things like phosphate reabsorption, calcium reabsorption, and those are associated with either blood pressure or for PTH that's only dependent on the level of calcium in the bloodstream. PTH is only released when plasma calcium is low. So if we have low calcium, we don't want to pee it out, we're going to reabsorb it. So there's a lot of hormonal action. Um, check it out. Let me know if you have questions. And that make, brings us to the very end, which should be an easy question because we just said it. Sodium conservation is accomplished by what? Aldosterone, ADH, ANG2, or norepinephrine? The answer is aldosterone because that is our sodium sparing hormone. If it said water conservation, the correct answer would be ADH. Beautiful. Those are the kidneys. I hope you enjoyed it.